He's on the throne. Amen. He says, look, how do you love those you are trapped with or loving those you are trapped with? You want to look at your life and what is happening to your life, whether it is at a family, personal level, friendship level, at a, at a job level, employee, employer level, or even at a national level. You hate them. There are certain names you don't even want to hear by the Bible. And the Holy Spirit was saying, if you want to be intimate with Christ, you've got to learn to love those you are trapped with. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 17. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on turn the verses, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him, whatever you do. Perhaps you can relate like I do. Like I was thinking about it early in the morning as I was getting ready for today. And just going through my thoughts and what God was speaking to me during the week. The chances are you know the, the phobia or the claustrophobia. That comes with commitment. So I couldn't be uncommitted to someone else. There was some kind of ripple effect. My dad would be upset about it because he wanted the dog to be there. So I was committed to Shona to some extent, not a choice of my own. Only instead of being reminded that she's your dog. But this time, you're not being reminded that this is your dog. You're being reminded this is your husband. This is your wife. This is your daughter. This is your son. This is your brother. But the problem you have is that you can't say they are not my friend. You are not cornered with them. These are people you're cornered with for life. In, in some of them, like if they were relatives and family to you, guess what? You can say, I don't want to talk to them, but you are with them for life. Then, this morning I came up with a, with a word. It's not in the dictionary yet. You can put it in. When you feel trapped with someone, there is a word I have come up with which is called trepiditis. Now, if you want to have an intimacy with Christ, this is where you need to understand that trepiditis means that you're stuck with people and you can't get rid of them. And Christ is the solution to dealing with trepiditis. There are three ways to cope with trepiditis. Number one, you either flee. You don't want, if it is a spouse, you ask for divorce. <coughs> you flee. But the problem with fleeing is that the next station you dock in, you will find trepiditis also waiting for you. And guess what? You have another option. The other option is you fight it. Because trepiditis has its own weaponry of fighting. You remind them who you are, and you also remind them who they are. A few, however, discover another treatment. Forgiveness. You either flee, you either fight, or you forgive. I don't have a model of forgiveness, but let me tell you, intimacy with Christ gives you a model of forgiveness. Now let's get to that very quick. Jesus was trapped with a dirty dozen. I call them the dirty dozen. He was trapped with a dirty dozen. These are wannabes, guys, grow, crooks, some of them. He just picks them up. There was no CV. There was no references. There was no exam they wrote. He just said, follow me. Follow me. And they were, these are not a group of guys who are 12 who are living together. Having fun. I like this group, the 12 of you. Come and follow me. No. 
He chose them from different backgrounds with different issues, dirty as they were. And I wonder, how did Jesus stay so devoted to these yes. men? If you think you've got a mess of people around you, let me tell you, refer to the 12. Forget the 70 and the 4,000. The 4,000 just left him. You say, ah, no more miracles. Hey, hey, you're on your own. We're finding another church. But how did, how did Jesus deal with us? Jesus dealt with this because he had a servant heart. He moved right from the palace to the lowest of lowest. He became a servant. And this we find in John chapter 13 when he takes the basin and the tower. This is the biggest demonstration that we find about Jesus. We don't find it because he's on the cross and he says, forgive them, Father. That deal is done. But the demonstration that he does prior to everything happening, when you forgive people because you are aware of what, what they will do, it's okay to forgive people because you are aware of what they have done. But when you know that they are going to cut your finger off and you say, look, I have already worked that out, they can carry on and cut the finger. I'm still going to love them, forgive them. I'm talking about loving the ones you are trapped with. So Jesus walks up to the upper room. The disciples enter one by one and take their places around the table. On the wall hangs a towel, and on the floor sits a pitcher or a basin. And any one of the disciples could volunteer for the job, but no one does because, guess what? They are in the politburo of a movement called Jesus Movement. They never saw themselves as the ones who should serve the other. So they are in that hierarchy. So they said that they should be a servant. We know the master should have sorted out a servant to clean our feet. But if they walk in one by one, Jesus looked and says, I'm waiting for the last one to enter in. The basin and the towel are mine. They are not aware of this. That that basin and that towel is mine for them. Few moments later, Jesus stands up and removes his outer garment. He wraps a servant's girdle and, and, and servant's uh, apron around his waist and takes up the basin and kneels before one of the disciples. He starts one by one. These guys were not coming from a shower. These guys had been walking the streets of Jerusalem, the dusty streets of Jerusalem, and only that job, touching the feet of people, was meant for the worst in society. He began, they are shocked. Peter is shocked. He says, you're not doing this. My tongue of food is sticking you. You're not doing this to me. And he says, hey, if you don't allow me to do that, you have no place in us. He starts one by one. He cleanses them. He washes. He unlaces their sandals. One by one. The grimy feet. After another, Jesus works his way down, up and down. He kneels, begins to wash them. Every circle has his pecking order. The workers were not even there. It was Jesus and the twelve. Guess what it did? In this case, the one with the towel basin is the king of the universe. He's not the servant of the of, of, of society. He's the king of the universe. He's the creator. Hands that shift the stars. Now wash away filthy feet. I want you to look into that. Because you might have qualified yourself by what you did to someone. You send somebody to school. And all you get is no thank you even. But guess what? The hands that didn't just make you and me. The hands that created the universe. Guess what they're doing? They're cleaning away the dirt. And no thank you is expected. 